Good morning, everyone. I, I apologize for my English, which is far to be perfect. <laughs> so, first I, I have to say I'm very excited to have the opportunity to present my work to you, and I really want to thank Mel and Rachel and Artspace uh, who invited me. I work at Palais de Tokyo since 2002. My first real job was cultural mediator in this very young institution that opened just a few months before I arrived. Palais de Tokyo is a center for contemporary art. It has no collection and exhibitions change every four months or so. The exhibition program is curated by a team of curators and their boss my boss, the artistic director slash president. Emma Lavigne, who will arrive next week, is going to be the first, first one, a woman, finally. Each artistic director has the freedom to compose a very personal exhibition program inspired by its own vision of art, the artist he or she got to meet during his or her career, and also inspired by the specificities of the architecture of the place. We have the, the chance to have generous exhibition spaces, natural light, a building with a specific history, and this work in progress aspect, a choice made by architects Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Vassal for their rehabilitation of the building in 2001. Another specificity is that the place is open from noon to midnight, every day, and that, well, except Tuesdays, but <laughs> that might have an influence on how artists think their exhibition, or at least influences the state of mind of our visitors, uh, whether they visit during the day or in the evening. All that drives the artistic program, and very often, curators and artists consider an exhibition at Palais de Tokyo as the opportunity to give a new dimension of, uh, to the, the artist's artworks. Here are a few images of projects we showed those past years. Here are some data regarding our audience. Every year, around 350 people visit our exhibitions. We had a record of frequentation last year due to the success of Thomas Saraceno's Carte Blanche. You can also notice that women are more represented than men and that our audience is quite young. A large majority is under 30 years old. Palais de Tokyo's public policy and cultural mediation is part of it, is to welcome this audience as good as possible and also to attract all, all the others who are generally person, persons who think contemporary art is not for me. When those persons finally made the choice to visit, and that generally happens when the communicational campaign points out a strong experience of visit, or when we organize some event that doesn't focus on the show, but on another more popular activity, like a ball, for example. So when new visitors arrive, cultural mediation has a crucial role. It embodies <clears throat> the values of the institution and shows its generosity. Cultural mediators are often the key to make the promise of a strong experience kept. Our general public mediation program is quite generous. We have free guided tours every hour. Mediators available for discussion at any time in the exhibition spaces. A young audience program through the year with workshops, uh, stories, tales, activities for the whole family, etc., etc., and workshops for adults every fr Friday evening. 
We also write, or I should say co-write, the cartels with the curators. Palais de Tokyo, because 40% of its annual budget comes from the cultural ministry, has also what we call public service duties. And among them, the participation, along with all other cultural institutions, to the artistic and cultural education, the uh, generic term we use, of pupils and any other audience considered as less privileged in terms of access to culture. Over 16,000 pupils and students visited our exhibitions last year. With some classes, we did more ambitious projects involving workshops and sometimes artists. We also collaborate with the Ministry of National Education in the training of teachers in the artistic field. Of course, we have a program for audiences with disabilities and specific needs. We like to collaborate with our therapists when we imagine more ambitious projects for them. And finally, we also have a dynamic program of mediation uh, with tours, workshops, activities for family, etc., for audiences with any social difficulties. Um, migrants, homelesses, isolated mothers, young delinquents, etc. For all these audiences related to what we used to call artistic and cultural education, most projects happen in the Palais de Tokyo, but sometimes also off-site. It is not a detail because it shows that we are as involved as they are and that we are not focusing on our little institutional environment. I would be happy to share more details about those projects later on if you're interested. Here are a few images of mediation situations. <coughs> and now here is the team. I work with two um, projects coordinator, Catalina and Simon, and with 12 cultural mediators who are constantly on the field of the exhibitions. The battlefield, somehow. <laughs> the team is multicultural. Some are artists, other art historians. Their common point is that they all believe that when you develop a regular relation with artworks, it makes you feel better. Beside that, they are all pretty different in their tastes, some are more or less shy, even mischievous. There are infinite ways to do mediation, and I encourage each of them to be as natural as possible because I recruited them for their personality. Yet, I also see them individually twice a year to discuss about their practice and <clears throat> there are those three advices that I often repeat. Guide your audience beyond comprehension. An artwork is not a problem we have to find a solution for. It is not a code that has to be broken. Of course we know it, you know it. But most visitors have this rational state of mind when they enter a museum. Guiding the audience beyond comprehension is offering much more than what was expected at first. Show your very personal path among culture, ideas, and knowledge. As a professional of culture, a cultural mediator has the chance to spend a lot of time among artworks, books, etc., and to be paid for it. Each personality will jump from one cultural object to another, designing a very personal path. 
That's exactly what everyone does in his life, more or less intensively. When a, mediator's, a mediator sorry, shows a part of its own path, it has a sort of mirror effect, and the visitor suddenly becomes more aware of its own path and start to consider it more preciously. Consider artists as promoters of the human soul. Artists are not enter entertainers or weirdos. You know it, but... Artists are a person who made the choice to explore the world and to retranscript those explorations with a non-scientific protocol. Being freed from rationalism and they decided to share that with us because they think it might interest other persons. I see mainly one goal to an artistic process, to enrich one's soul. It is simple, but it is often useful to remind it to an audience. The position of Palais de Tokyo's cultural mediators has probably two main influences. Nicolas Bourriot and Jérôme Sens, who were the first co-directors of the institution, uh, showed a lot of works that belong to what uh, Nicolas Bourriot called esthétique relationnelle, relational art. And the specificity of this artistic program um, made, them, made them think about the necessity of putting cultural mediators in the exhibition spaces because those artworks um, expected some um, real active participation of the audience and it's not that easy for visitors to suddenly say something, do something, uh, being active. Esthétique relationnelle uh, invited cultural mediation and in return, I would say, um, it also inspired us through the years um, to organize our practice and we took the habit in a way to highlight the creative part of each person, visitor, to reinvent transmission, to be full of empathy of course. The fact that we had a lot of immersive uh, installation made us um, sharpen the senses of our audience, and, and then because doing cultural mediation is um, establishing a, a dialogue between the artwork and the visitors, but also between the visitors themselves, we had to, to make differences attractive so that people would listen to someone else's opinion or point of view about an artwork. And then, <clears throat> I have to admit, I kind of thought about it preparing this presentation. I thought, looking at the team, there is probably a strong influence of romanticism. Uh, we are all kind of dreamers and we all consider the relation to art as a necessity in our lives. So we very naturally encourage states of contemplation when we are with the audiences. And we also often make the demonstration of our own daydreams facing artworks. Of course we help <coughs> our audience to put emotions into words because we are used to do that. We talk a lot together about, about artworks and about our own experiences. And, and then we cherish the feeling to be part of something greater. We, the fact that we are a team is, is very important. There is a special dynamic and, and we like to transmit that also to the audience.
Now, I would like to be more specific uh, with the project we had during Mel's exhibition in spring 2017. Mel, I will try to summarize your project. If my shortcuts are too brutal, feel free to step in. <laughs> the exhibition was called Dangerous on a Way. It was composed of a video, sculptures, and a performance. The performance, <clears throat> to hear with my eyes, took place on this stage, where you could see objects of rituals, and sculptures, a drum in the back, a burned trunk, water, and a rattle here on the right. Every day also, <clears throat> performances led by professional performers took place on the platform. The performance itself was inspired by the work of linguist and anthropologist Felicitas Goodman, who is the founder of the Cuyamongue Institute in New Mexico. After a series of ritualistic actions that were useful to prepare the mind and the body, one performer, one performer activated the drum during 15 minutes at the speed of 120 beats per minute, and the other performers, no more than three generally, but sometimes 10, stood in a specific position with eyes closed. Clo eyes, eyes is closed. Felicitas Goodman noticed the recurrence of certain postures in archaeological artifacts from prehistory to antiquity and in more recent ethnological researches. She had the, the intuition that this recurrence might highlight the fact that those postures were ritualistic and more precisely body positions favorable to reach other states of perceptions, like shamans do, for example. And indeed, performers entered into a kind of trance. Mel, do you want to be more specific about the exhibition? <laughs> During weekends, <clears throat> visitors could also perform on the platform in the exhibition in front of other visitors. So we had two sessions each day of the weekend, about three participants per session. And prior to performing, there was a discussion with a mediator. The mediator had to be clear about the intentions of the artist. And they also made the participants aware of their responsibility in the perception of others' visitors uh, during the, the performance. It was not just doing the performance as a, uh, a solo experience, it was really uh, being part of an artwork and respecting the artist's will. And <clears throat> mediators also presented an introduction to the practices of the Cuyamangue Institute and explained the physical effects the performance might provoke. After that, participants had to sign a disclaimer if they were still okay to participate. <laughs> and uh, finally, mediators led a repetition of the different steps and of the choreography. And then the, the performance uh, was led by a, a professional performer. We had uh, some projects with uh, groups during the show. Uh, a little project with a class of uh, blind uh, 
children. It was, uh, it was very intense. It was very beautiful. And we also had a, a project with a class of teenagers. We generally do projects with schools that uh, are located in so-called <coughs> priority education areas. This was not the case here. The kids were quite privileged in terms of access to culture. The school was a <coughs> private bilingual institution. But it appeared very early that their cultural and artistic references were very classical. And they were at first a little suspicious toward com contemporary art, maybe influenced by their own parents. So <clears throat> I imagined a, a journey for them ending on the stage of Mel's exhibition. The teacher and I worked together to prepare them to be able to perform. Also, this was not a, necessarily, a necessary goal. The past was our priority, and we wouldn't force anyone <coughs> to perform if he or she wouldn't feel comfortable with it. The first step was an immersion in Tino Segal's Carte Blanche, uh, end of 2016. It considerably changed their idea of what art should be. And from one session to another, from a simple discussion to a workshop with Mel, from a visit to the collection of ritual objects to moments of introspection with a Chinese portrait, for example, we arose their curiosity and I think made them grow up pretty fast during those few months. In the end, they all experienced the, perf experienced the performance once, and only five went on stage. The others had not the permission of their parents. The project was rich, intense, and I really would like to thank Mel again for her availability. It allowed us to reconsider the state of perception we are generally in when we confront two artworks. And I was, after that, waiting for an opportunity to compose a program that would propose to invite, to visit, sorry, an exhibition in different states of mind. End of 2018, Palais de Tokyo held Thomas Saraceno Carte Blanche, <coughs> exhibition called On Air. One main aspect of the show was the relation between the microcosm and the macro, the universe. And <clears throat> the artist expected the cultural mediators to, so to say, uh, massage the visitor's brain in order to make them feel that relation to the cosmos. So I worked on a program in collaboration with a yoga studio that is very much oriented toward unconsciousness, spirituality, and healing. It was a great success in terms of frequentation, and the mediators associated to the project were, were very happy to exchange so easily with visitors on another level. So here are some uh, details of that program. Today, those notions of well-being and inclusion are more necessary than ever in our practices. The museum, the art center, is a citizen's place. The audience's expectations toward us tend to, diversi to diversify, and more and more experiencing art is considered as a possibility of transformation by individuals. We, as mediator, have to create social cohesion to make those personal experiences even better when they are shared, when each one has the feeling to be part of something greater, something common. And as you may have guessed it, cultural mediation is also very often a matter of activism these days. Thank you.